would like for you to do this morning is if, if you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Uh, Romans chapter 4. You know what? I'm not sure I even... For those that may be watching us here shortly, I, I don't think I actually put the, the notes up. So we'll get those up. Uh, I don't see Ann or uh, Elaine here anyway. So uh, anyway, we'll get we'll try to get those notes up so you can, if you want to, you can re-listen to it. Uh, we're glad that people can, can join us this way. Uh, happy Resurrection Day to everybody that may be watching. Uh, the, the title of the message today is called The Justification of Life. Justification of life. So, uh, what I wanted to say about is uh, a question that the Lord gave me. This was, I actually put this together on Thursday night, which usually is uncommon. A lot of times I'll do it on, on Saturday night. But um, it, this was what He posed to me. He said, how, how can we truly celebrate the resurrection unless we walk in the predetermined purpose of God in this event? Uh, you know, we celebrate an event that's, you know, around the world there's a celebration of it, but. The true celebration is in us enjoying and, and, and being and fulfilling uh, our, the, His predetermined purpose for the reason Jesus was resurrected to start with, and that was for for us to have that resurrection life working in us, um, and for us to enjoy the fruit of His labor, not to continue to labor to try to produce our own fruit and our own work, which end up to be always be words but to enjoy the, the fruit of his labor on our behalf, to, to, to enjoy this, this uh, life that he's given us. And so in chapter 4, verse 25 in your notes, I've actually used the, uh, uh, the amplified version. It says that uh, who was betrayed, and I want you to key on that word there because we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Uh, who was betrayed and put uh, to death because of our misdeeds, our sins, and was raised to secure our justification. He came to. He was raised to secure our justification. That word justification means, uh, in the Amplified, they add our acquittal. But justification means to be declared righteous, to be declared in right in the right standing with Him. And I love this part in the Amplified, making our account balance, uh, the gizomai, right, Kim? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and absolving us from all guilt before God. I noticed that He didn't say all sin absolving us from all sin, but also all guilt. Because in, until we are absolved from all guilt, uh, really the, just saying that we're, we're forgiven from our sin really is not uh, of much of purpose. And this is what I'm saying about what Jesus intended for our life, this resurrection life, is to cause this guilt, this guilty conscience, this, this guilt, uh, uh, self-condemnation, and all these things that we got from the, from the fall of, of Adam, uh, that we want to get by, uh, get restored to because of, of the justification that we now have, the, the life we now have. Now, if you look at Romans chapter 5, the, the question in your notes uh, is how does Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, give context to this verse? Well, if you look at that, uh, just flip over to the next chapter, it says, Therefore, as, th as though as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Uh, so we, we all felt condemned because of one man's uh, uh, failure that, that carried on into all of our lives. Uh, uh, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So the free gift that came to us, that which was his, uh, become, taking our position and taking our sins into his body and putting them away, uh, and then coming out without sin one single one of those left. They were all, when he came back from the dead, those were all left behind. And they weren't his sins, were they? They were ours. Uh, and so that just the result, the result should be justification uh, of life. There should be a life that proceeds, uh, pr proceeds into our, our lives uh, as a result of our being justified by his, by his work. Uh, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's, that capital M, obedience, many will be made righteous. Amen. So his obedience is what matters under the new covenant, Amen. not our obedience. Amen. Amen. And if we understand that and we walk in that justification of life, then his obedience will actually begin to produce the obedience in our life as a fruit, not as something that we're laboring to do. Uh, now look at, let's go to... Uh, 
Let's go over to uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus, this is speaking of, of what Jesus said. Uh, he said, uh, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. Um, if you back up to verse 5, it says that based upon what God's, what God's heart was regarding the old system, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Uh, but a body you have prepared for me. So God was more interested in what was coming, even though the, 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 bull, the blood of bulls and goats and all that symbolism was pointing toward Christ in a way that could never take him away. Uh, but we, as I've used the illustration many times, uh, the sins of, under the old system were put on a credit card, and Jesus paid the bill. Uh, but there came a fullness of time where the actual, not the shadow, but the substance was coming into play, here when he said that God actually made a body for Jesus to come in and be that sacrifice and offering. It says in verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do, in the volume of the book, in the volume of this book that we read, it's all about what Jesus came to do. Uh, I came to do your will, O God. Uh, so uh, what was that will? Look at the, the, the second half of verse 9. The second half of verse 9 there in Hebrews chapter 10 says, uh, He takes away the first that he may establish the second. So he, was, he came to, to do away with the old system and to put in place a system that could not fail because it wasn't based upon man. Uh, the other one was based upon man, man's ability to, to keep it. Now, uh, what I wanted you to, uh, to look at, let's, uh, this, this idea of, of his... Um, Betrayal, I think, is really an under understood principle in what ha was happening uh, in the time that Jesus was waiting to to do away with the first and establish the second. And I want I want us to look at that because I think it's really interesting um, what God's heart was in this whole this whole matter. And I want to just just the uh, uh, the question there in that uh, based on the context. Was what was God's will, and what was the problem with getting rid of the first covenant? What was the, what was God's dilemma in getting rid of the first? Because He wants to establish the second, but He's already God is on His side is still on the hook for the first covenant. And so, if you go back, we're not going to turn there, but in, in Psalms eighty nine, you'll see that that, that God God was uh, He was bound by His word that came out. That's why He promised in, in Psalms eighty nine He was promising King David that someone from his genealogy was going to, to reign on his throne forever. Now, who was that, who was that person that's reigning on the throne of God forever? Jesus. That was Jesus. And he came from David. Uh, his, his genealogy was through David. Actually, blood-wise, through Nathan, uh, not through Solomon. Uh, Solomon was the, the forerunner to Joseph, who was supposed to, supposed to be the, the father symbol in Jesus' life. But the blood side, and that's the difference between the genealogy in Matthew and Luke. It shows one is Joseph's genealogy, the other one is, is uh, Mary's genealogy. And so uh, Mary was the one that was the blood relationship through Nathan, the son of David, to become uh, the, the one that was going to reign and, and, on, and sit on that throne forever. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a need on God's part to remove himself from the old covenant. Uh, and this had to do with this betrayal, and this is what this was always kind of something that's been a little bit of a mystery to me. And as I was looking at this, I thought, "Wow, the the, the length that God went to to, to uh, remove Himself from this in order to be able to establish." So there was a paper trail there. It was a backdoor clause that God God had in place. And I want to lay just a little bit of foundation in Exodus, Exodus chapter twenty one. Uh, Everybody loves to look at Exodus on, on Easter Sunday, right? Uh, almost like going to Numbers and reading a few things out of Numbers. That'll get you uh, drowsy sometimes if you don't know that it's about Jesus. It'll make you, used to make me kind of like when you have the reading through the Bible in a year thing, you sort of kind of wanted to double up on Numbers just to get through reading it. 
And now when you see it's about Jesus, you're, 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 you're slowing down and seeing everything about his life. So Exodus chapter 21 and verse 32, it's talking about here, uh, if, if the ox doors a male or a female servant, he shall give to their master 30 pieces of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So this story here is about uh, uh, the difference between uh, what the value of a servant versus the value of a son or a daughter is. And uh, so I wanted to establish a principle here because in this case, uh, in the law of Moses, it was established that if somebody knew they had a, an animal that was that had a reputation for hurting people and he didn't do anything about it, uh, and then it ends up goring somebody, then, uh, then that if it was a servant, then the, the, the owner of that animal, that whatever it was, uh, would pay 30 pieces of silver to, to uh, redeem that. And so, but if you read the, the, the prior couple of verses here, it talks about uh, the son or the daughter, if there's an, uh, it, so that it kills a man, or verse, thir verse 29, but if the ox tended to thrust with its horn in times past and has been made known to its owner and he has kept it uh, confined so that it has it killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner shall also be put to death. Wow. If there's, there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to, the re, to redeem his life what's, whatsoever is imposed on him. Whether it is a gored son or a gored daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. So if it was a son or a daughter, you could put any value on it. There, there was any, there was no limit to the value you could put. You could say, well, I want to, I want to, you know, twenty million dollars, but for a servant, thirty pieces of silver. Uh, now there's a, there's a basis in this that that uh, that is so important to understand. Let's go to Zechariah. This was in the law for for a purpose, because this is the, how Jesus was going to be valued. Uh, he was going to be valued as a slave or as a servant. Uh, but there was a need for this if, if, because without this, um, and you'll see here how important this is, God could not go on to establish the new covenant until he finished with the old. Uh, and if you've heard this before, I, I mean, I, I really, I, I looked at this uh, some years ago as I was studying it, but this week I felt like the Lord wanted to, to show you how much, uh, with how much uh, joy and, and, and emphasis that we can put away the old system because of how God dealt with it. In Zechariah chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah is my favorite of, uh, of the smaller prophets because he's, he, somehow God let him pull back the curtains and see into Jesus and what Jesus was going to do. So he's the most Messianic prophet of any of them uh, as far as the minor prophets. I mean, I know Isaiah had a lot of, a lot of good prophecies concerning, but Zechariah actually got the to understand some new covenant principles here and get to see them through this uh, with the curtains pulled back. And so uh, in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 10, uh, he's talking about in this prophecy, he says, and I took, I took my staff, beauty. Now, if you look at that word beauty uh, in the Hebrew, that's the same word for grace. Um, and he, he cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I made with all the peoples. Now I want you to see what God's trying to do to break this covenant that he had. See, the people were, were uh, bound by whether or not they would, could succeed by what they did or what they didn't do. But God was committed on his side of the covenant by the fact that he said he made the promise. So uh, without the, him dealing with this, and see, he couldn't be, he wasn't going to be free from the old and be able to enjoin himself to us in the new. And this is so, this is so amazing how this was put in here. Uh, and you'll see this worked out in the life of Jesus here in just a minute. Now, um, <clears throat> with, uh, so it was broken on that day. Uh, thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. See, it's the, it's the poor. It's those that aren't deserving. The poor, the ones that are, those are the ones that saw into this mystery as something that was going to be for us. This is for us. Uh, and, and we knew that this was, that we all know this morning that this was the word of the Lord. So uh, for, in order for the new covenant of grace to be established, Jesus had to be broken as the, as the fulfillment of the old. Awesome. He was broken. So good. Okay. 
uh, and so in verse now verse uh, uh, now what does this say what does this say about God's heart let's stop with verse uh, verse 10 let's start with verse 10 there a minute uh, God's heart was he was he so wanted to, to bring an end to this covenant and this is what we said this is what we just quoted in, in Hebrews chapter 10 God so it was so much in his heart he was so weary of this system of man trying to do it from his side he wanted it to be finished from his side so that it can be it can be forever established and forever uh, part of our justification of life. He wanted to see he was so ready for this to be done with. And so um, that's what it's that's what this is speaking of. Now, Zechariah, let's go to verse 12, where it says, Then I said to then I said to them, uh, now the, the them there. If you, if you go forward into the New Covenant, it was the high priest or the, the chief priests. Now, under the old system, uh, how did God deal with the children of Israel? Through the high priest. So as the high priest went, so went the people. So the, the high priest was the one that represented the people to God under the old system. What about the New Covenant? Okay. It's the same. Who is our high priest? Jesus. For how long? Forever. Forever. So as he's as as Jesus is under the new covenant, we'll see this in a minute. He is the high priest of this better covenant that's based upon better promises, and we're going to see that here in just a minute. So uh, God had to deal with his backdoor clause here. He had to, to get out of this covenant. He was dealing with the high priest under the old covenant to establish this. So he said to them, "If it's agreeable to you." Give me my wages. And if not, put a little asterisk if you have your Bible there or if you had in your notes there because that's in, the, that's in your notes under that verse uh, 12. And it says, and if not, I'll lift Oh, wow. He said, he said to his son, and if they won't give me the wages, then Jesus refrain. Don't go any further. And so I had never realized how important it was for the betrayal and for this to be to, this to happen this way before Jesus could proceed uh, in going to the cross. He was waiting. In fact, a lot of what he was belaboring to get in the Garden of Gethsemane, which Gethsemane means olive press, uh, was he was he was. He was waiting for this to happen. This was the only thing that was standing in the way of him going on forward. Now this is this is this is amazing because this is God getting getting rid of, getting rid of the old covenant from His side. And I think if anybody's listening this morning that may be from a, a Jewish background, I think this is in your this is in the, the the prophets and it's in the law for a reason to give you to give you freedom from feeling like you're still in bondage to this system from which you feel like, you may feel like God has not turned his back on, that he still may be trying to honor this through Moses, even in the nation of Israel today. He's not interested in the law of Moses anymore. He's establishing his son in this new covenant is what's coming to pass in the promised land even today. It's not about returning to the old. It's Amen. about making the new established in Israel as well. Amen. And so that's what's happening in our midst. So, so look, he says, uh, then I said to them, to the high priest, to the chief priest, if it's agreeable to you, if you want out of this, pay me. Uh, and if not, Jesus, refrain. Don't go any further. So they weighed out for my wages, what? 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Uh, they considered, they valued him, uh, they valued Jesus as the price of a servant price of a slave of really not very much value but that's prophetic because you're going to see that because he was allowed to be valued in, in, in that way we can now be valued as a son or a daughter that had no limit on price and we'll see here what that price really was established and this has anybody ever seen this before okay uh, I think that this just this just really blew me away when I saw what, what was what was happening here and how Jesus, I always wondered, why, was, why did he have to go and do what he said to Judas? Go and do what you got to do. 
uh, you know, go. And, and so now we're going to fast forward here in just a minute. Now look at Zechariah chapter 11, verse 13. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. That princely price. You think God can't be sarcastic? <laughs> <laughs> that princely price uh, that they set on me. So he was the prince. Uh, in fact, look, look at uh, if you if the, the illustration of even Joseph in the Old Testament. Uh, Joseph, in, in his symbolism of, of, be, of being the symbol of, and likens the shadow of Jesus, what did he have, what was he done, what happened by his brothers? Sold they sold him out. They sold him out uh, to, the, to, to, to the world, to, to the, Egypt, the Egyptian traders. And so he went into, he went into to Egypt, became the ruler of all of it, and then he, what did he do? Who did he marry? A Gentile. He married a Gentile bride. Guess what? Jesus did too. That was all a symbolism of, of what Christ was going to do for us. So he was sold out. Yes. I found something that went with the verse you referenced. Is Exodus 21, 32. If the ox gores a male or female servant, Psalm 22, 12 says, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Amen. Yeah, he was surrounded. See, I just in this, into my heart as you were preaching yeah, that. In this moment... This was, this was a critical, because he wanted to fulfill, and when, when he said it, when Jesus said it's finished, he established the new covenant. But when the 30, when this, when this exchange happened between the high priest and Judas, that God was able to put an end to the old covenant. Amen. You see that? Yes. Okay, let's, let's look at that. So it said uh, uh, in verse, uh, uh, that princely price that they set on me, verse 13, so I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Oh, wow. Wow. Jesus did exactly the same thing. Let's look at that. Uh, so uh, in this place, uh, who determined the price for the betrayal? The high priest. The priest determined. And we're going to see that. So see, because see, they gave him 30 pieces. And this is Zechariah prophecy. They gave him 30 pieces of silver, which just happened to be, and they all knew it, the price of the, that was established back in, in Exodus. Okay, so let's go to let's go to Matthew chapter 26 now. Matthew chapter 26. Starting with verse 14. I just think I just want to set this up a little bit. You know, they they, they had just had the Last Supper, uh, and uh, Judas had been a partaker of the communion along with the rest of them. But he was in this moment he recognized what was going to happen and what was going to be needful for him, so that he didn't have to refrain. Isn't that amazing that that's where the olive top was put in there? It's like he said to me, Jesus, refrain if they won't if they're not going to pay me. Uh, you, you've been, you've gone as far as you can go. Isn't that amazing? Wow, that's amazing. So uh, here we go. Fast forward. That was prophetically put in there by Zechariah, you know, a thousand year, eight hundred years before. So verse fourteen it says, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? So who again? Who did they let determine the price? Chief priests. They let the priest decide what the value of betraying Jesus was. And it just so happened to be the priest said, ah, man, he's worth, he's, he's worth what a slave, he might be worth what a slave would be worth. So 30 pieces of silver. Wow. And so they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. And so from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So the exchange, the exchange happened between the high priest that was the honored representative of the people under the old covenant so that God could, could be paid off, it could be a payoff for him to be free from any, any obligations he had under the old covenant. You see that? Yes. That's an amazing thing. Now, uh, and then we go into the Passover and Jesus is betrayed 
And so all of in, in all of this this time, like it says that that he was betrayed, he was put to death because of our misdeeds. I never understood the part of this betrayal and how important it was, because God wanted to God is God is a just and legal God, and He wanted to make it He wanted to make this happen on the terms that would cause Him to be free, because He was already weary of it. He was ready to let it go, and it also says in the Hebrews that what we see at that time that Hebrews was written that these things were uh, these things were being were fading away. These things were fading away because the system was done. God was through with his side of it. Isn't that amazing? Now, uh, so again, the question there in your notes is why was it necessary for the high priest to set the price? Because he determined who Jesus was. And he represented the people. So he was the legal, honored by God representative to make that determination on behalf of all of Israel, for that under that old system, that old covenant system, the high priest had the right to make that determination for the people. And he valued it as, as it says in Exodus for 30 pieces of silver. And then at that point, then he said, okay, then they paid him, and so Jesus was no longer told to refrain. There was no more refraining. His, his drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane were, it's like, Suddenly, where he was like agonizing, Lord, if there's any way to make this not happen, when there's an exchange, when the exchange was made, then he got up and said, "Okay, it's it's done, it's a done deal." Now, uh, now I'm about to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. So the, the refraining was over, and his agony. Uh, uh, Lauren's not here, but I just I, I really appreciated what she said about that. The agony that he was going through, and I'm sure with the father, but. There's good news right here at the end. I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now, I about to say now. now. He, that's Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. Now, as we just said, the, the high priest under the new covenant is Jesus himself. And now he gets to establish our value as a son or as a daughter. Right? You're, not worth, you're, not, you're worth a lot more than 30 pieces of silver. You're not, you're not valued as a servant or a slave. You're valued as a son. But remember, in, in back in Exodus, there was no limit to the value you could place. You could say $20 trillion. My son is worth $20 trillion to me. So that's the redeeming price I want for his death. Okay? And that's you, by the way. Okay? So let's look at this. Uh, what, what value has God placed on us as sons? Let's look at this uh, in, in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I think I can say this without... Uh, getting too emotional about it, but uh, first of all, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, right? Amen. And that's that's Second Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty. All the promises of God are not based upon what we do now under this new covenant. They're based upon what Jesus has done. So there's not one promise. I want you to I want you to understand this. First, let's determine your value, and then I want to talk about this promise for just a second. What uh, verse 31? What then? What then shall we say to these things? The ones what, what we just talked about here. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who what? Justifies. So if that's if it's he justifying, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us under the terms of the new covenant as high priest. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. So who shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ? Who shall separate us? See, you've been valued as a son. Uh, now, again, all the promises of God now. And so uh, in, this, in this moment, uh, when, when Jesus became our high priest, and now he is administering this new covenant as high priest, this is the value that he's placed on us. That as a son, we are valued with his son. Amen? If he wasn't willing to spare his son for you, then that's the value he determined on you. Not 30 pieces of silver, but his own son. That's the value you have. And that's the agony Lauren was talking about. Knowing for us that, that he had that value for us, mm -hmm. that we would be that we, this would this would be determined in, in, in our own heart and our own mind, so that we could have this justification of life that he declared, declared us justified by Christ's work. So forever and ever, we should, there's not one promise now you can buy with your checkbook. Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. Or a promise you can buy you, you can buy from God with a with a night of fasting. Amen. That's right. Or with an all all with a three day prayer vigil. Amen. There's not one promise you can buy from God now because they were all paid for for that thirty pieces of silver that was exchanged for the price that they thought was a servant and a slave. Now his prom the promises that we have through him is all because of what he's done, not what you do. Yeah. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong if you want to fast to get to where you can hear God clear or whatever. But this system that God hated so much that limited us from being able to receive from God because we thought it was based upon we, what we do and how, how determined we are and how much faith we have and how much money we try to give some ministry or, or, or do, do, you know, fast for, for 30 days like they did under the old system because, see, it was all on them. Right. On the new, it was all on Christ. Yes, Lauren. I heard something this week that struck me very powerfully. It said that God is really relational, not mm -hmm. transactional. Absolutely. He wants to walk um, you through the pain, not yep. Yep. alleviate it for you. Amen. Amen. Right. And so this this transaction let him get into the relationship side of it. Mm -hmm. This exchange of this 30 pieces mm -hmm. of silver uh, was this this transaction released God from, from a, a promise or a curse that was based upon man. Before, before it was determined by, by man's ability his, man, his response, whether good or bad, determined whether the promise was going to manifest under the old system. Now it determines whether it's going to manifest in your life because of what Jesus did for you. And so don't ever, don't ever let, uh, and, and I'm saying this because this was God's way of freeing you, that he's no longer interested in the system of man's payment, man's economy of trying to obtain a promise based upon what they do, good or bad, of either getting rejected from the promise or receiving the promise based upon their performance, but getting the, getting the promise in your life based upon Christ's performance Amen. on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So there's, no, there's nothing hindering you from receiving because all the promises are yes and amen in Christ. Amen. So we access them by trusting in the, in the payment of Christ. That he became valued as a servant and died as a servant but for 30 pieces of silver so that we could be valued by the price of his son. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Last verse here, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I, I see so many people burdened with, this, with, these, with, with these things about having to uh, feel like that they're having to pay God off uh, in some way or to, to uh, uh, go through all of these, uh, all these, this, these, these strains and this, well, if you're serious with God, man, we need to get serious with God. <laughs> what we need to get serious about is the new covenant. That's right. 
Because, see, the new covenant is what gives you the access to the promise. We don't need to get serious with God by meaning we need to do more or try harder or, or grovel more or do all those things because all that all that says to us is so we can get it by our own merits. And God was trying to get rid of that merit system. Because why? The main reason was because nobody was married to him. <laughs> and it's God's heart to give us the answer to the promise. He wants us to, he wanted, he wanted their obedience to give them the promise. The problem was they couldn't be obedient. So he had to find one person. Who was the one person that was obedient to all the law? Who was it? Jesus. He, from birth to death, he, when he said it's finished, he started, he established the new covenant that was finished. The old covenant was finished in the betrayal and the exchange of that third piece of the silver. So in the moment he said it's finished, then the, the economy was based upon Christ. But God's new economy was based upon Christ and Christ alone. Amen. So what, you, what happened to you 30 years ago or what happened to you 30 minutes ago does not negate you from the promise if you're in Christ. Amen. Amen? Yeah. And so that's what causes justification of life. See, that's what causes He said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. abundantly. How can you have abundant life if you think you're on the hook for making God, uh, God give me or bless me with, the, with all the blessings that are in Christ but only based upon if I deserve it. Right. Well, if that were the case, then nobody would deserve it. Right. So why are we still trying to deserve it? It's like I said, that, that they're trying to duct tape that, that staff that God broke in half through his son. They're trying to duct tape it back together and prop it up, prop up the body of Moses so that we can go back to work and earn our, our promises by reading Deuteronomy 28 every week. He says, if, I will, if I'll just do this, God will do that. The problem is I can't do it all. I can't do just one of those things. James 2.20 says, if you, if, you, if you miss one point of the law, then you've broken all of it. Hmm, not very good odds, is there? And that means just one time in your life. Jesus didn't miss one point one time in his whole life. Because he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And the fulfillment was on his shoulders to obey every law in, in thought, word, and deed, in his body, in his life, so that he could be the legal representative in the flesh for us in this body. Amen. What a, what a, what a wonder he, he is. What a wonder he is. Uh, uh, chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant with better promises. Now, uh, uh, never can we go back and attempt uh, to, to buy something with our again with our fasting, with our labor, with our sweat, with our checkbook. Uh, if you'll just give this amount in the next thirty days, and you're going to have a financial you're going to have a financial breakthrough. Uh, no, your financial breakthrough is because Jesus was broken, and He wants to give it to you. And when you freely receive it, see, you won't have trouble giving. You won't have you won't have trouble giving because you've received it freely. If you've bought it, then you're gonna you don't want anybody else to get it unless they paid at least what you paid for, right? <laughs> or more. Yeah. If I if I got this blessing in my life because I gave 22 percent, then if somebody gets a blessing without only paying three percent, then that person's not going to be happy. That's the that's the older brother syndrome, right? Okay. He's out there. Earn and trying to earn what he already has if he just go in his father's house and receive the blessing. And that's that's the system that we're free from. Amen? Amen. Uh, so never uh, so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now we have received not the, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that's from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by Jesus Christ. You have a Holy Spirit in you right now, and that Holy Spirit is in you to let you know that it's not because of what you deserve or what you earn or what you pay the price for. It's theirs and, and it's yours because of what he paid the price for, what Jesus paid the price for. Amen. You don't deserve it because of you. You deserve it because of him. Amen. And if you're in Christ, you are an inheritor of every promise. Every promise Amen. is it. And so uh, as we, again, going back to what I felt like God told me, it's just how can we truly celebrate? We're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. How can we truly celebrate it? 
unless we walk in the predetermined purpose of God, unless we're free from the old system, it, and, and, unless we see the price that, that, that actually the transaction God went through to, to end his relationship with that old system. He is under no obligation under the law of Moses anymore, transactionally. He's free from it. It's, you saw it in the law, you saw it in the prophecy, and you saw it, you saw it fulfilled in Christ. Didn't you? you saw those three things. Amen? Amen. Amen. So if, if go out this weekend and, and enjoy uh, the, the justification of life now that you have because of Christ. Because that is what will best, it's like, okay, what's going to be more of a celebration of resurrection? If I go out, well, I just, you know, I just didn't, I just didn't deserve, I just don't deserve this. And I, you know, I, I don't, I just didn't deserve Jesus dying on the cross for me. I just, it just, I just don't deserve that. Is that, is that a way to honor it or say, you know what? I never deserved it, but he gave it to me anyway. And I'm going to bless his heart and I'm going to bless his predetermined purpose for me by enjoying and celebrating and, and receiving freely from him of Amen. what he paid so much to give me. So, Amen. Amen. That's, that's, the, that's the true celebration of Easter. Amen. Yes, he, he rose from the dead, but he rose to guarantee our justification, to guarantee the promises. Uh, and, 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 the, and also, and this is the most important one because he, he, he was raised to guarantee our life eternally. Because no matter what happens here, nothing can separate us from his love. And, it, and we will rule and reign with him forever as his family, as his children. God's, God wanted a family. Uh, he wanted sons and daughters. He didn't want servants. And the only way he could do that was get rid of the old system that all it can do is create servants. Under the old covenant, you know, they never could become, they were never given a promise of eternal life under the old system because it wasn't available to them except through Jesus. Uh, there were promises about life in the natural, but not, not eternal life. Jesus came by his blood and gave us a better, better covenant with better promises. And one is that if you live and believe in me, you'll never die. Amen. You have resurrection life in you now. It's his resurrection life. And it will cause you to triumph in Christ. Not triumph in what you do, but triumph in what he did. Amen? Amen. Everybody that's watching, uh, I hope you all have a blessed resurrection weekend and, and just enjoy the justification of life and honor and celebrate it by receiving what he paid to give you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.